Hi, everybody. This is Corey Merrow from the University of Connecticut. Um, I am a biogeographer and I guess sort of general modeler. And um, I typically work on forecasting uh, ecological responses to global change. And to do that, I often um, use Max Enter models closely related to it. So I think that's why uh, I'm on the hook for, for explaining uh, what goes on behind the scenes there. So this is the um, first time I have ever recorded a presentation. So it will probably be moderately embarrassing and clunky. And so I hope that you enjoy that. Um, so now I need to share my screen. And uh, the only technology that I really am proficient with is code. And other than that, I'm kind of a functional old person. So this could, uh, this could be variable. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna talk about Maxent uh, today and uh, closely related Poisson point process models. And I kind of use those interchangeably. Uh, so you'll have to excuse any jargon that comes, comes with that. Um, and I'll show you why they're related today and, um, and some of the math behind it. So the outline uh, is uh, that I'm gonna just very briefly mention what people mean by Maxent in different contexts, just to kind of set the stage for what we're trying to do. Um, I'll talk about the uh, algorithm underlying Maxent, the sort of original formulation of it its relation to point process models, this acronym PBM, point process model. Um, and then I'll look at a couple of aspects of building these models that are um, you know, fairly specific to uh, Maxent, which is background selection, regularization selection, and offsets or, or modeling sampling. Um, and there are many other considerations that go into this kind of stuff. Uh, but those are kind of more general to, you know, any sort of regression based technique. And so I'm, I'm um, leaving those for, you know, somebody else some other day so that, uh, so that this isn't a three hour presentation. Um, so these are the kind of the, the parts that are pretty specific to my sense. So um, people mean a lot of different things uh, when they uh, are talking about Maxent in biology and especially ecology. Um, usually if somebody just says Maxent, that often means that they're talking about an SDM um, built with a particular software package. But the principle of maximum entropy, as you're probably aware, is, is far more um, general than that. It's, uh, it's basically just a parsimonious way for defining probability distributions. And so uh, it can be used in any sort of modeling context in which you're you're looking to estimate a probability distribution. And it's just a, basically a different objective function. So like in maximum likely esti likelihood estimation, you choose the appropriate statistical distribution for your errors and you maximize the likelihood uh, in order to estimate parameters. This is just a different function. It's, an ent it's the entropy function. Um, it's this guy down here. We're gonna talk about this a lot more, but it's if P is the probability distribution that we want um, and Q is some other distribution that is uh, being compared to it or as a reference distribution is sometimes the jargon used. Um, it's just that the, we want to um, optimize this function instead of a likelihood function. So it's just a different, different rule for um, optimization. Um, sometimes, so, so in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a very general thing for inference about probability. Um, a lot of times people, when they say max n, uh, often mean the, the specific software package um, developed by Stephen Phillips uh, and colleagues in 2006. And so that's, uh, sometimes that's just referred to as maxent.jar because that's the, the um, piece of software that you click on to get it started. Um, some people also might refer to maxent when it's implemented in other software, either um, a very closely related model that's, that's it's fit slightly differently, but um, the maxnet package, which is not a misspelling, it's because it's fit with the GLM net R package. Uh, that's a different thing that Steven also put out uh, as a fully R based implementation of um, Maxent. Now it, it, it's fully R based in the sense that the, the fitting algorithm is in there. It doesn't have all the other bells and whistles that, and conveniences that Maxent that jar does. Um, or people might wrap around uh, some of these functions. So Dismo or Biomod 2 
Um, I know they both wrap around maxent.jar. Um, uh, ENM eval, uh, I think does both maxent.jar and maxnet. Uh, so you have a choice. So people may be referring to um, these other software packages um, or even more generally than that, um, any distribution models that are closely related to maxent distribution models, um, which can be Poisson point process models. And so this is kind of the definition that I go with because um, all these are maybe, um, well, the latter bit here are maybe just different ways to fit it. And I don't really care about how you fit it. The main thing, the generality that I'm interested in is what are the inputs and how do you interpret the model at the end? And so because they use presence only data and we get a relative occurrence rate at the end, um, that's the kind of the general theme. So, so I, when I say Maxent, I mean some sort of model could be fit with any different type of software. You can be thinking about it as a point process model, or you can be thinking about it as a maximum entry, entry model. Doesn't really matter to me, um, but this is what I say when I mean max in. Okay, so let's dig into the algorithm here that uh, that max in fits. So, callback Leibler divergence is a is a generic uh, metric for comparing two probability distributions. So. Um, so we've got these two distributions here, P and Q, and we want to know how similar they are to one another. Uh, one measure of similarity might be just to measure the overlap between them. Um, for a variety of reasons based on information theory, uh, the callback leibler divergence is defined as, uh, or sometimes it's called divergence, sometimes it's called information, um, is defined in this way. So um, it's an integral over x, so x is the horizontal axis here. One of these distributions is p, let's say it's the slight gray one. The other distribution is q, let's say it's the dark gray one. And so what we do is uh, we calculate this integral. It's just some, some metric that is derived in information theory. We're not going to get into the derivation. If you want to do that, become a statistician or a mathematician. Um, we just want to be users of this stuff here. So um, the idea is that uh, this information uh, or this metric is a small number when these guys um, are very similar to one another. And what it represents is the information lost when you approximate, oh, I didn't change my notation here. These are supposed to be uh, P's and Q's. Um, there's probably a joke there, but I'm not gonna make it. Um, so instead of G, it's supposed to be a Q, and instead of a F, it's supposed to be a P. Um, and so the idea is that um, if these two guys are very similar, you don't lose a lot of information by replacing one distribution with the other, okay? Um, and so they have a very low divergence. They're pretty similar to one another. And so uh, if they are um, very different from one another, these two guys are pretty different from one another. They have different means, they have different variances. Um, that might lead to um, a loss of information if you replace one distribution with the other. And so um, that's the continuous version. These are also uh, can be represented for discrete functions. So discrete meaning it's not a continuous value here on the x-axis. Um, so similarly, and we just replace that integral with a sum, and it can be a sum over the bins here. But basically, it's this pi log pi over qi. And so it's a way to say, how close is, is p to q? Um, you may have seen this before in um, community ecology where uh, the Shannon Weaver index is used. It's an entropy measure. Um, and so when it's an entropy, it's got a negative sign in front of it compared to the information that we were looking at before. Uh, and that could be to, to quantify the diversity of this community. And then we could apply it separately to the diversity of this community to, to see how they're different from one another. So in this case, the PI would be the relative abundance of uh, each species in this community, and this is a pretty diverse community, um, so that may have pretty high um, entropy. And uh, this, we would also calculate it over here, and we could compare the two values as some metric of which community is, is more diverse. So maybe that's where you've seen it before. So it's, it's um, uh, mathematically, it's the same thing. Uh, conceptually, you know, we're trying to do something totally different here. Um, it's not derived in that conceptual way, but it's a, it's a measure of, of um, how similar these guys are to one another. Um, so you could use this in any sort of general way, let me get myself out of the way here, um, to compare two distributions. So across all these figures, 
there is a gamma distribution, uh, which is the solid line. Now, it looks a little different in the distributions because it's the um, y-axis are scaled differently, but the solid lines in each of these are different distributions. And we can ask how similar that gamma 4, 4 is, for example, to any of these other uh, distributions that are shown as dotted lines. And so you could look at this for a second and ask yourself, which one do you think is gonna end up most similar? So the similar, the most similar would have the, um, oops, there we go, um, would have the lowest value of information loss, the lowest callback Leibler divergence. Um, and if these were negative numbers, they would be entropy, so this would be the largest value. And so what it means is that this distribution right here is considered the closest to the gamma 4-4. Four four. Uh, distribution 3 is second closest. And then uh, distribution 2, this one up here, is a little bit close, but really not that close. And this one is way, way off. So this is just a general measure of comparing between two distributions. So what does that mean in the context of MaxN? Um, Switching to the notation that is used sometimes in the literature, um, and by the literature I mean um, me, so probably nobody else uses it, but this is what I wrote in some of the papers that I reference here. So I use this P star um, to indicate the predicted distribution uh, of a species. So if we want to get a map here, man, I'm always in the way. If we want to get a map here that has some scaling of um, uh, the relative probability that a species occurs in each location on the landscape. Uh, we want that to be a function of the environmental vectors, uh, an environmental vector of conditions at the location, uh, xi. And so we basically, you know, if you kind of squint at it, you see a pi, the p log p over q. Okay, and um, basically uh, this q is normally taken to be a uniform distribution, so it's a one and it goes away. And that's the, um, the maximum entropy assumption that gives max end its name. What it says is that, uh, if this is a uniform distribution and you are trying to estimate something that is as close as possible to this guy, uh, you're saying, I am a priori assuming that the species is equally likely to be everywhere. And so therefore, I want to estimate a distribution that is as close to a uniform distribution across geographic space as possible. And so that is sort of the fundamental assumption of Maxim. And so those, those are the different distributions that we're um, that we're talking about in, in sort of the previous slides. Q is your prior guess of where the species is. And if you a priori have no knowledge, you say it's equally likely to be everywhere. And then the distribution that we're maximizing the similarity between that and your prior distribution um, is your predicted distribution uh, across geographic space. Now, when I say prior distribution, uh, don't get that confused with, with Bayesian prior. Um, there's uh, an unfortunate overlap in the jargon between some of the maximum entropy inference. Um, sometimes this is called a reference distribution, which I think is, it's nice that it's a different word, but it's um, vague, so I don't think particularly helpful, uh, at least not when you're just learning this stuff for the first time. Um, so this is not a prior distribution on parameters as you would um, have in a Bayesian model, if you're familiar with that sort of thing, but it's a basically a prior guess at your answer. Um, your, your prior guess at the spatial distribution in this case. Okay, so now we don't just want to model the, or, or use this predicted distribution uh, across space as a, we don't wanna just make it as similar as possible to a uniform distribution. We need to account for in some way the data. Now, this is a long, terrible slide, uh, which I wrote on here because I expect it'll be easier for you to look back at this um, afterwards or just pause the video to read it. Um, but the gist is that we know some information about that geographic distribution. For example, we know the mean temperature uh, in July where a species occurs. We maybe know the mean value of precipitation where the species occurs. Uh, we maybe know the variance in the, in the value of precipitation uh, where the species occurs. And that's because we have presence locations. So the idea is we want to include some constraints. So here, let's say that Z just represents the minimum July temperature. Well, I can take the average value of the July temperature uh, across all of my, let's say I have 20 presence locations. Probably shouldn't build a model with 20 presences, but um, so let's, let's make it 100 presence locations. Uh, I can take the average value of temperature at those locations, and what I try to do when estimating the 
uh, parameters of a Maxent model is I want to make sure that the weighted average across the whole region matches that mean, at least to within some tolerance. So if my average value of, of um, temperature is 14 degrees, what I want to do is make sure that the, the weighted sum across all locations on the landscape everywhere, not just the presence locations, um, times the predicted probability distribution has an average of 14. And then I do that for all the other predictors that are in my model. And then maybe I consider doing it for the variances of those predictors, or maybe the quantiles of those predictors. So ultimately what we end up with is a bunch of constraints that can be framed in this way. You calculate some uh, statistic associated with your presence locations, and then you say, make sure that my distribution, my predicted distribution matches that constraint. Um, okay, so here I go into the details a little bit. Um, Basically, I have sort of a conversion here between what the different types of constraints mean in, in terms of a regression model, because we're kind of working our way up to make this look like a regression model. Um, so if you constrain the mean uh, of the, the temperature for your presence locations, um, that would be corresponding to a linear term in a, in a regression model. If you want to constrain the variance of your um, predictions, if you hear somebody rustling around over here, it's because, it's because my dog's getting bored of... Um, listening to all this max end stuff all the time and so he feels like he already knows it all and uh he's just gonna you know curl up and, and go to sleep hopefully um so uh variance corresponds to a quadratic term in a regression model so long as the mean is also in there anyways uh covariance corresponds to interaction terms and um quantiles of your distribution correspond uh to uh, the hinge terms that are, I'll talk about in a moment, but if you're familiar with Maxent, that all these hinge terms are, are what allow you to make a very flexible model. Um, oh, 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 maybe he's interested again. Nope. Just, uh, just getting comfortable. All right. So how do we, um, fit these models? Well, this, the, from the sort of first principles perspective, um, it's the method of Lagrange multipliers. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of how you solve this sort of a thing, but I basically wanna just provide the reference so that if you wanna go look up this kind of stuff, you know to look up Lagrange multipliers. Um, and I think this is uh, explained in the, the Phillips, at least maybe the 2004 or the 2006 paper, or maybe both, I can't remember. But the idea is that we're trying to optimize our entropy function, P log P. Uh, we've got some constraint here uh, based on the probabilities needing to sum to one across the predicted region. And we've got some constraint on each of these um, bits of data. So here, this is just a different way of writing this constraint. The idea is that the thing in parentheses here sums to zero, and this is the coefficient that we want to estimate. So it's just kind of um, rewriting this by subtracting this term over to the other side and saying that we're adding zero because this term is supposed to add to zero. Um, that may sound a little bit opaque, and that's okay, um, because it's not something that you need to be able to do in order to use Maxent. It's just something that if you want to understand um, a way of deriving uh, parameter estimates, uh, this is a way to do it. Go look up Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so let's get a little bit more intuitive here um, with a graphical example of what's going on. So say we've got a landscape with nine cells and these cells are co colored by their value of temperature. So the dark gray cells have a value of 10, um, the medium gray have a value of 20, and the light gray, which don't really look that much lighter than 20, have a value of 30. And so we've got the mean annual temperature in each cell. Now, additionally, we've got three observed presences. This tree occurs in each of these cells. And so I can calculate a constraint from that. Um, and, well, actually, let me, let me first say, what I want to do is estimate the relative probability that this tree occurs in each cell. Okay, so I don't, I don't have any samples over here. It doesn't mean it doesn't occur over there. It just means I don't have any present samples. And so I want to estimate the probability that this tree is in each of these cells. That's my predicted spatial distribution. And so I can calculate the mean temperature of presence locations. It's add up the values and divide by the number of presences. So the mean value is 20. And so the question is, the maximum entropy distribution is the flattest distribution over all nine grid cells that has a mean temperature of 20. So what's the flattest distribution you could have? Uh, the probability, by flattest, I mean the probabilities are as similar as possible to one another across all nine of these cells. Well, 
the answer for that is maybe pretty intuitive. It's that there's a one ninth probability across each one of these cells. Okay, so all of them have an equal value because if you um, add up the values of all these guys and divide by nine, um, you've got a mean of 20. And so um, that's constraint number one. Constraint number two is that so that they're interpreted as probabilities across the entire landscape, those probabilities have to sum to one. So that's why it's one ninth instead of just saying, you know, you could also say the value in each cell is 17, uh, but then you would have to divide by the sum of all the cells in order to get the probability um, to sum to one. And so um, you can also imagine that there are other distributions that are consistent with these constraints that don't have maximum entropy. So these are the two constraints here that our temperature, average temperature is 20, and our probabilities have to sum to one. And oops, one of them could be that uh, there's equal probability in each of these 20 cells, and there's zero probability in each of the other ones. That's not maximum entropy because these values are more different from one another than, than in the previous example. Um, we could also say something like two ninths here and one eighteenth here. This has a little bit more entropy, so it's a little bit more likely, potentially, but um, it doesn't have maximum entropy. So that's why we have this maximum entropy assumption is to differentiate among these cases. I've just shown you three cases of different distributions that are consistent with the constraint. So we need some rule to choose among them, and the rule is maximum entropy. Um, this is, uh, I think I put this in there because I wanted to give you a reference of how you could actually calculate this with um, two constraints at the same time. So here I start off with my prior distribution, um, and then I add one constraint kind of like I just did, and then I add a second constraint, and I show you how the probabilities work through. So this wasn't something I was gonna talk to, through because it's, um, it would just take a while, um, but it's a visual example that you can do these calculations and make sure that you estimate these probabilities following the example that we just did. Uh, and this is from the appendix of my 2013 paper in case that's um, something you wanna look at. Okay, so the solution that we get for, um, for maximum entropy prediction is uh, got some jargon associated with it. And um, the idea is that it's an exponential function and what I've got here predicted is the relative occurrence rate. That's the jargon that I'm going to use for the prediction. Um, and I'm going to give you a more precise definition on a slide that comes up, but it's just relative differences in probability across your landscape. Um, the prediction at a particular cell is a function of the environmental covariates at that cell. So Z represents a vector of environmental covariates. Uh, X represents the spatial location and I tells you which location you're talking about. And um, that is a function of a prior or an offset, which I'm going to ignore until the end of the talk. So just pretend this has a value of one that corresponds to a maximum entropy prediction uh, with respect to a uniform prior expectation. And then there's this exponential function, which is uh, your vector of coefficient, your vector of environmental conditions times a vector of coefficients. So this is kind of where all the meat of the prediction is and then some normalization constant that is not interesting. It's just something that you divide by. Um, it's the sum of the value of the cells across the whole landscape. So you divide any predicted probabilities by this to make sure that um, your predicted relative occurrence rate sums to one over the entire landscape. So this is where all the action is. These are the environmental covariates that you spend all sorts of time pulling together in rasters or um, vectors. These are the coefficients you're trying to estimate. And um, that's what we're aiming to get. Um, so this prediction, uh, the jargon that I prefer for this is a relative occurrence rate. I think in the Maxent JAR software, it's called raw output. Um, and the interpretation of it is that given that a presence has been observed, uh, and that's a very key part of it, given that a presence has been observed, it gives you the relative probability that comes from each cell in the landscape. So if I've got a little map down here, it says, I already know that you've observed one presence. Tell me where you think it came from. And so the red cells here would be the places that's most likely to have come from. The yellow cells here would be sort of second most likely. The blue cells would be least likely. And the gray cells would be uh, basically not likely at all. Um, and so the important thing is that this relative occurrence rate should be normalized to sum to one over the landscape. If you have relative differences in probability, that's as easy as 
adding up all the values across the landscape and dividing each value by that sum. Um, and so uh, this key part of it, given a presence, um, is what differenti differentiates it from presence absence models. So presence absence models uh, will often predict uh, the absolute probability of presence in a cell. So uh, if it's 50%, it would say, of all the cells that are like this one, the species would be expected to occur in half of them. That's not what is predicted here. Uh, this says that given that you found a presence, uh, where is it most likely to have come from? It doesn't tell you the likelihood of finding a pre presence. The likelihood of finding a presence is called the prevalence. It's the proportion of cells that the species occurs in across the landscape. And that is not something that we know or are able to estimate um, typically. There are a few very special cases, um, which in my opinion are not particularly useful ones, um, that allow you to estimate prevalence in this way. Um, and so what that means is that this prediction only describes relative differences in probability. Um, there is, and I didn't put slides on this because it's not something I actually do, so, um, so you'll have to forgive me for rambling here for a moment. Um, you can convert this to, um, there's a couple of different ways that the Maxent GUI converts this into an absolute probability of presence. Um, the important thing to know about that is those are based on assumptions, and in my opinion, they're, they're probably pretty reasonable, like least bad assumptions if you're required to convert to an absolute probability of presence. Um, but they are based on assumptions, not based on data. The data that you need is prevalence. Um, and so my recommendation is that you actually don't really need that format, um, these absolute probability of presences for many things that you're gonna do with these maps. And so there's no reason to add an additional layer of assumption. Um, you know, many of the things that we do in ecology involve maybe ranking cells or um, plotting things visually. You know, it, it doesn't really matter whether you can convert this to an absolute probability. Um, you might say, oh, well, I want to be able to compare values among species, so I want to get an absolute probability so that it means the th same thing among species. Um, you know, that's, that's a fair point. Uh, the other option for doing that is just to choose a threshold on your, on your map and, um, you know, compare the threshold of maps. So I haven't used it very much. Um, I don't like making an assumption that I don't have to make. And so anyways, that's a little bit of the, the backstory on the other options, but I'm gonna stick with relative occurrence rate for um, the rest of this talk and um, I don't know, the rest of my life unless somebody convinces me otherwise. So um, there's a key bit here uh, that I try to do visually without too much math, um, which is to show you how the Maxent uh, algorithm leads to something like a likelihood. And the, the reason for that is that I wanna be able to connect this to Poisson point process models. So here's our, um, our callback Leibler divergence written with the notation that we use for distribution models, SDMs. Um, here is the solution. If you were to plug this solution into your callback Leibler divergence, so take this value, plug it in here, um, you end up with something that's like a log likelihood for the lambdas. Um, and so you can do that substitution uh, on your own time. Um, but basically what it amounts to is that if you're trying to estimate uh, the values of lambda, uh, that would be like uh, maximizing the, the likelihood uh, associated with the sum of the values at the presence locations. So M indexes uh, presences. And so it's the difference between the values at the presence locations and the values at background locations. Now, um, I'm gonna get into the detail on what background locations are, but they're basically just other locations on the landscape that are not uh, observed presences. Actually, they can include the observed presences as well, if you like. Um, so they're just other locations on the landscape. And the idea is that this likelihood is higher if there's a larger difference between the predictions that you make at presence locations compared to uh, background locations. So. Uh, basically, you can turn Maxent into a maximum likelihood model, uh, and that's very convenient for a couple of different reasons. Um, well, I'll get to those reasons. Well, one of the things that it solves, okay, so we've got this likelihood associated with the lambdas. Um, we need to select a um, set of locations to compare to the presence location. So these are known as background locations. Uh, 
And uh, what we're trying to do is um, estimate this comparison. Okay, and we're back. Um, as I was going through that last slide, I realized that things were not in the order that I either expected them or meant for them to be in. Okay, so here's where we just left off. We were looking at this guy um, and talking about background locations. And so what I wanted to do was then go into background selection to give you a little bit more of a detail of, of what we're trying to estimate in this model. Okay, so um, welcome to the worst slide of this presentation. Um, so the idea is that we want to compare environmental conditions at occupied locations or presences to the conditions available to that species uh, in the rest of the region of interest. The idea is we want to say something about how much does the species use environment X in proportion to its availability? Does it like this environment a lot or does it not use it very much? Okay, so there's uh, two different ways you can look at this, okay? So let's say there's a landscape that has 10 cells with uh, cooler temperatures, temperatures below 20. And if the species occurs in every single one of them, you would infer that cold locations are important because 10 used and 10 are available, okay? So that background, is the number of cells in the landscape that have temperature less than 20. So the background includes those 10 cells. So let's say in contrast, the landscape were different and there was a different background that had a thousand cells with temperature below 20. And if there were still only 10 presences across those thousand cells, you would infer that the cold cells are probably not very important to that species. And so for this reason, uh, the background that you contrast your presences against are very important um, for what your model infers. Does it use things in proportion to their availability? Does it use them um, disproportionately to their availability? Uh, and that, that's what is basically the, um, the verbatim way of saying what's optimized here. So we can look at um, a couple of different things here uh, as to sort of visualize what that background um, means. So we wanna compare these presences to available locations. Um, I, uh, just as a note here, I put in, sometimes it's called, unfortunately there's a lot of jargon, presence background, presence pseudo absence, use availability, habitat selection, these all mean the same thing. You're comparing what's going on at presence locations to what's going on everywhere across the landscape. And so the question is, uh, how do we choose these guys? Do we choose them randomly uh, from across the landscape? Do we choose them from some buffered distance around the uh, presence locations? Um, how many of them should we choose? This is um, the motivation for moving this section up here that I just did a minute ago is because these are gonna, this is what motivates the point process um, models. So um, the important thing about point process models is that they, the cool thing that they do is that um, they reduce this background selection problem to a domain selection. So basically it just, um, the only thing that matters is where the domain is, where, oops, where this entire region is, not how you sample from them. So I'm going to show you why that boils down to just integration. Um, early on in, in Maxent, and even before people were calling it Maxent, they were doing present pseudo absence models. And there was a lot of effort put into um, trying to figure out how to select samples from this location the, the, across the background to compare to the presences. And basically the, the solution of point process models is don't worry about it, it's just integration. So you just follow the rules of integration, it's fine. And so I'll show you why that's the case in a minute. Um, but visually what we're trying to do is compare two distributions. So let's say um, our presences, so this is for Protea punctata in the Cape Floristic region of South Africa. Uh, Protea punctata is sort of an overstory shrub that's mostly up in the mountains in the colder areas. And so let's say we look at the minimum July temperature. And so this is um, winter in South Africa. And so these are sort of the cold temperatures that the species tolerates. So let's say that we're looking at the presences, which are the little orange dots here. If you know South Africa at all, these are all the mountain ranges. Uh, the distribution of values of temperature, minimum July temperature at presence locations are shown by this orange curve and the distribution of values in the background within this bounding box, this blue bounding box that's around it, are shown uh, by this blue polygon. And so what Maxent tries to do is estimate 
uh, a smooth version of the ratio between these two curves. So you can see like there's a little bump in the curve here. That's because there's a little bump in the uh, ratio of this guy to this guy. So if you were to go along and bin this and, and estimate ratios everywhere, you'd get a kind of a jagged curve that looks something like this. And basically what uh, MaxN does is estimates a smooth version of the ratio of the height of these two distributions across the landscape. And then instead of just doing it in one dimension, it does it in um, potentially many hundreds of dimensions, which is why we don't just draw plots of it and, and estimate that ratio. Um, but the important thing here is that this curve depends a lot on the background because it's the ratio of this guy, the orange one, to the blue one. So if the blue one changes, this ratio changes, and your inference about what the species prefers changes. So in contrast, here's the same thing, but it's not on the pretty color scale. So this, these two blobs, the orange and uh, blue blobs, are the same as these two blobs right here. And so if instead of choosing my background from this blue box, I just take it from everything inside this gray polygon, that gives me this distribution that's in black, it's kind of hidden behind the scenes here, that's why it's dotted, it gives me this black distribution. And that gives me a very different response curve that has this peak here in the middle. It's modal. So this is the response curve associated with the ratio between the gray presences and the black background. And so I actually have a very different inference about what my species prefers compared based on how the background was chosen. If I choose this region-wide background, it's going to say, well, there's an optimal temperature for it that's got a mode. If I choose this more restricted background, um, it's going to say, that uh, it basically likes cold conditions and continues to like those cold conditions. Um, so neither one is uh, right or wrong. It kind of depends on what the application that you're, you're using it for is. Um, I guess the, the main issue is that if you were using this model, you would want to be sure that you're only projecting within this region. You wouldn't want to extrapolate any further. This model is a little bit more reasonable for extrapolation because it sort of follows ecological theory that you would expect um, species have a modal response to critical environmental drivers of its distribution. Um, but it may not give you a lot of resolution in uh, the differences in habitat quality within that bounding box. Um, there's a good study about that by uh, Vanderwall et al. And what they do is they look at, um, in one particular region, they say, do I draw the background locations only from the other sampled locations? Uh, this is southwestern Australia. Do I draw it from the entire polygon uh, within southwestern Australia, or do I draw it from all of Australia? And they find that they get pretty different predictions depending on which way you do this, and that's because they're you know changing the background behind it. And so the important thing is to um, think very carefully about how you select your domain to represent the the contrast that you want to make against presence locations. Um, so I guess another way of framing the Maxent assumption is that uh, when we're looking at our, our Kolbeck-Leibler uh, divergence here, another way of framing that is to say, let's estimate this ratio, this curve, to be as flat as possible. So let's assume that the a priori, the presence distribution, looks exactly like the background distribution. And let's only diverge from that as little as possible uh, to make a prediction. And so the idea behind this response curve is it is the flattest possible curve that is consistent with the data. All right. Now, um, the key thing here, so we, let's getting back to the likelihood in, in anticipation of how we're going to set this up for bus on point process models. Um, the idea here is that we need to compare the sum of the values at presence locations when we're optimizing the likelihood uh, to values at the background. So the idea is, there's n background points. How do we choose them? Do we choose them randomly? Do we choose them some distance from presences? How many to choose? So forth. And this is the, I mean, there's a number of things that point process models solve, but uh, this is one of them for presence background data. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second and um, go get some more coffee. I'll be right back. And I'm not going to edit it because I don't know how. So we're just going to pause. Okay, we're back. We have a uh, sufficient amount of caffeine to make this make this thing happen. All right, so um, now what I want to do is relate the um, Maxent model that we were just looking at to Poisson point process models because that actually makes our lives uh, 
um, a bit easier. So there's a little bit of suffering on the details that's required, but um, basically it allows you to use regular old GLM software. And so um, it's worthwhile. Okay, so a plus on point process model. Um, a spatial point process is, uh, is something where the locations of the process, the species occurrence, um, are random variables. So, you know, in contrast, and so on my landscape here, I've got a domain and I've got a bunch of little uh, circles and those are presence locations of a species. Now you might be familiar with Poisson regression where you might draw a box on here and you count the number of individuals in there. Um, in that case, the, the box is, the, um, is fixed and the random variable is the number of individuals that you observe in there. Um, in contrast, what a spatial point process is, um, it's, it defines the locations as the random variables. So the, the coordinates of these guys are, are the random variables. And so um, the extra uh, fancy uh, term to add, add here is inhomogeneous Poisson point process, because the idea is that um, the species is not distributed evenly across the landscape. It's, it's distributed inhomogeneously uh, or has uh, a varied distribution across the landscape. And so uh, we use that extra jargon, or in fact, um, if we're reasonable people, we never say it because it sounds ridiculous. Um, but uh, so we just call the, this uh, lambda. This is the intensity function. And it is the uh, distribution that we're after. It's the species geographic distribution, which is a distribution lambda that varies across the entire landscape. Um, I will say, unfortunately, the lambda used in the context of, of a lot of definitions of point process models is not the same as the lambda that we had used um, uh, previously in the MaxN stuff. So this is just the notational convention thing that um, just a bummer. I guess there are only so many Greek letters that people like. Uh, so the, the two properties of this uh, point process model are that the total number of presences in here is Poisson distributed. Uh, and distribution is basically the integral of the intensity over the entire landscape. So uh, if there are uh, 100 samples on this landscape, that would mean that if we integrate it over the entire thing, the value is 100. And so n would be a uh, Poisson random variable with a mean of 100. And um, the other assumption of this is that the n presences are independent of one another which is maybe not always a great assumption depending on dispersal limitation or behavior of your species if they're mobile, uh, et cetera, but that's an assumption of the model. And uh, the idea is that the counts in a particular area, let's call this little red area A, um, are independent for, for disjoint regions. And so the way that we get the um, expected number of counts in some particular area, uh, is the expected number of N in a given area is to integrate this intensity surface over that area. Okay, so basically just add up all the little probabilities of these guys. And I will say that um, we tend to think of this not as, uh, in, in distribution modeling, we tend to think of this not as an intensity function, um, which when you integrate it gives you the number of records, but rather uh, a density function which integrates to one, so it's a relative rate of occurrence, because uh, the number of records that you have is usually not something that's, that's particularly of interest. So we've just turned it into a density by dividing by the sum um, across the entire landscape and we refer to this as the, the density function instead. Um, so this is the uh, function that we care about. This is the species distribution, this, this intensity function or density function. Um, and so in contrast to the relative occurrence rate, that we got from uh, max n. This is a continuous function, and we have to integrate it over uh, a given area to get the relative probability in that set. Now that might be a kind of a trivial thing because your environmental data may come on a grid anyways, so you're stuck thinking about this in terms of a grid and not actually as a continuous function, and that's just fine. Um, but the idea is it has a slightly different interpretation on the continuous scale. But if you, if you integrate it over, let's say you've got this as a gridded landscape 10 by 10, um, each of the values in those 10 by 10 cells, if you sum over the 10 cells, should sum to one in order to have a proper density distribution. Um, and so uh, what we can think of, this, uh, this lambda that we're modeling here, 
we can make it a log linear model of environment. So as is common with um, Poisson data, we can use a log link and we can model how that lambda varies as a function of uh, an intercept and covariance. And so what we would do is at a particular location or a particular grid cell, we can estimate the covariates at that location and we can estimate coefficients, uh, betas associated with those um, associated with those uh, with those environmental variables. And so um, this is a bunch of math that's probably best left for you to read if it's something that you really care about. The key point is that you can show that you can write the likelihood for this point process model as a weighting of a Poisson likelihood. So this little bit right here, if you're familiar with maximum likelihood for a Poisson model, or if you're not and you would like to be, you can Google it, it'll be the first thing that you find. Um, this is a um, Poisson likelihood. And this is a little weight that's associated with it. So the really nice thing about this uh, point process interpretation is that you can fit it with GLM software. Oops. You can fit it with GLM software um, and as a weighted regression. And so if you want to look back at how this contrasts with MaxN, that likelihood um, that we're talking about from over here is related in the sense that we've got the sum of the presences, the sum of the predicted values at the presence locations, which is this first term, and then the sum of the values at the background points, which is this integral right here. And what that means is when you're maximizing the likelihood, all you're trying to do is evaluate an integral over the entire landscape. So this is the reason that background selection is taken care of ex to the extent that you just have to define a domain. Um, you, any method to integrate over the landscape to, to approximate this integral as a sum is totally fine. And so here I also mentioned that lambda is a log linear model. So, um, so it's pretty easy to implement this stuff with a GLM software because if this is just a weighting of a Poisson likelihood, we can write that in the following way. And somebody's running me. Um, we can write that in the following way, where we define a formula where we model the um, presence per unit area, which is what this weight corresponds to. Um, we can define the weights, and then we can just fit a regular old GLM with a log link and weights defined according to uh, those up here. And this is, oh, I thought I put the reference here. Um, this is explained in um, the Renner et al. Uh, review on point process models from 2015, I think in Tree. Um, which is a really good paper that I, highly, I think I actually recommended reading it uh, as part of this um, course. Uh, but in particular, the appendices have a bunch of extra information that help to break down the, um, the concepts into pretty clear um, implementations in, in R that makes it a little bit more clear about what's going on. So, um, so the idea is, so if we break this down a little bit, um, we think of these weights as little tiny areas and we're modeling the response per unit area. This is just a clever way to write what those weights are. The idea is that you give much more weight to background points than to presence locations. And so if your, your presence data are coded up as, presence background data are coded up as ones and zeros, uh, this has a value of one if it's a presence location and it has a value of 10,000 if it's a background location. And so uh, we can basically just plop those weights into a regular old GLM, and this estimates a Maxent style model in the form of a uh, weighted regression uh, or, or point process, process model. Um, so the, the summary here is that uh, Maxent and Poisson point process models solve the same problems in different ways. Um, the Maxent jargon is older, uh, PPM is newer, but they really are the same thing. Um, I think that people will shift towards the PPM stuff just because people are more familiar with regression techniques a priori. Uh, but there's still some use in thinking about, um, not, maybe not for the way that you practically implement the models, but there is some use in understanding the, the Maxent ideas behind it, as I'll show you a little bit later when thinking about uh, offsets. So um, the takeaway is you can just use weighted GLMs to fit your distribution models if you want to use Maxent. Okay, so sw switching gears a little bit, um, I want to talk about a, a feature of um, the Maxent GUI software, which has become synonymous with using Maxent models, which is regularization, which is a way to penalize your models for um, complexity. Uh, and what it does is it allows you to build 
potentially very flexible, complex models while controlling for overfitting. Okay, so the, the question that, um, I don't know, is, well, I don't know, the forefront of statistics is how much complexity is the right amount of complexity um, for a model? And there's no correct answer to that. There's just different guidelines. Uh, and so what we want to do here is, uh, for using a MaxEnt or machine learning style model, we want to offer it complexity so that we can detect interesting patterns in the data that we might not have detected by eye, but we don't want it to get out of control. We don't want it to overfit. Um, I have a review of this stuff with a bunch of um, uh, really great biogeographers um, from a few years ago where we kind of discussed the pros and cons of um, more and less complex models. So if that's something you're interested in, um, that's the reference. Okay, so um, in order to motivate regularization, I want to go back to kind of basic statistical principles and look at ordinary least squares regression. So let's say you've got a bunch of data points here and um, you want to do a best fit line between them. Okay, so you can measure all these little distances between each of the points and, and the line, and your best fit line is going to be the one that, that minimizes the squared sum of these differences. Okay, so this is uh, least squares. The least is the minimum pound amount. The squares is the metric that you're using to define this distance, and the line that minimizes that sum of squares is the one that you're going to um, fit. And so um, I start with this because regularization is something that you can use in any regression anywhere. Um, it's not a maxent specific thing. Um, it's not a distribution model specific thing. It's just a general technique. And so let's start with general ordinary least squares and, and see where it gets us. Um, so there's two critical um, components of the estimators of any coefficients that we have to consider. One is the bias and one is the variance. And so those have a very specific relation to one another. And uh, it's actually probably easiest to see here. Um, okay, so this is a dartboard. Okay, so you're throwing darts, you're trying to hit the center. So if, if you've got uh, a model that has that often hits the center, or if you're playing darts and you often hit the center, you've got a model with low bias and low variance. If you've got a model with low bias and high variance, that means that you've got uh, a little bit of a scatter around the value you're aiming for, or let's say the true value of the coefficient, but um, you're, you're missing it sometimes. Uh, high bias and high variance, is, uh, so obviously this is our best case scenario. This is a tolerable scenario because it says we're getting the gist of it right, we're just not super precise about it. Here's a slightly less good scenario where we are both biased because the central tendency isn't on target, or we're not near the true coefficient value, and we've got high variance. And then this is the worst case scenario where we're not only uh, missing the target, but we're missing it very consistently, so we might have confidence that this is the right answer when in fact it's not. And so, um, so these are the, the, I guess, the, the potential trade-offs in estimates of um, parameters. So how does that um, spell out here? Sorry, I'm getting a million phone calls here, so I'm gonna pause for a second and see what's going on, if I can figure out how. Okay, we're back. Um, so the error decomposition of a particular parameter estimate can be broken down into uh, a part that's due to bias or um, how close we are to the mark, a part that's due to variance, how spread out we are around that estimate, and a part that's just due to error. And so that ordinary least squares uh, estimator that we were looking at before, um, has this nice property of being unbiased, but it can have huge variance. And that variance can happen when your predictor variables are correlated with one another, or if you have uh, a large number of predictors. Both of these um, increase with, uh, uh, can increase the variance. And so if you wanna study models that have uh, a great deal of, a, a number of predictors in them, as we often do with MaxEnt, because we wanna explore different functional forms, um, we need something that can control for that high variance. And so regularization is the solution for that. The idea is that we reduce the variance in estimates at 
at the cost of introducing a little bit of bias. So if we've got some total error, we can break it down into a part that's due to variance. So here on this axis, um, we've got model complexity or the number of predictors in a linear regression, if you want to think in linear regression terms, uh, and the error. And so there's low variance uh, associated with uh, models of low complexity. And as you get more and more parameters in the model, the variance in those parameter estimates can go up. Um, however, you may well uh, pick up the pattern better and you may um, have less bias if you have more predictions in the model. One of them may be more likely to to um, improve your prediction. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off here. If you sum these two curves, you get the total error. And the thing is, is that you'd like is to minimize the total error. And so what you might do is introduce a little bit of bias to reduce your variance and minimize your total error. And so that's what regularization does. And the way that it does it, um, we're gonna talk about one particular way, which is the lasso. There are a variety of ways to do this. This is a very popular one um, for reasons that I'll show you in a second. Uh, the lasso regression does this by just taking our um, ordinary least squares estimator and adding this regularization term to it. So it's composed of two bits. And the, the idea is it penalizes coefficients for having large values. Uh, so lambda is the regularization parameter. You have to choose this. Um, and it determines how strong the penalty should be for including either extra parameters in the model or having... Um, uh, large values of parameters. And then this is the sum of the value, absolute values of each of the coefficients. So if you're trying to, to minimize your sum of squares, adding something positive to it increases it. So that adds a little bit of bias, but the idea is that it maybe can reduce the variance in your estimate. So what this tends to do is shrink these guys towards zero. So this is a pretty amazing plot here. And what it's got is the value of coefficients for a model. So there are, in this model, there are 10 coefficients. And so each one of those is represented by a different color. Here is the regularization multiplier. So this guy right here, it's on the log scale. So this means little regularization. And this means a lot of regularization. And so in the limit where lambda is really little, this becomes zero. And you just have regular old ordinary least squares. Uh, so if you look at sort of a slice vertically through here, that's the ordinary least squares estimate. It's the value of each of these coefficients um, when lambda is very, very small. And uh, as you increase this um, regularization parameter, what it does is it shrinks all of these guys towards zero. And eventually what it does is it has the effect of shrinking them so that they become exactly zero. And so what it does is in effect performs model selection. So if you take a slice through vertically, it gives you the value of the coefficients for any um, particular value of the regularization parameter. And if some coefficients are shrunken all the way to zero, that means they're no longer in the model. And so this has the really nice property of um, doing essentially model selection for you because it throws out parameters. And so um, here across the top of this plot is the number of parameters that are retained in the model. And so the question is, what's the best value of lambda? So there's uh, a way to do this. Now, this is not something that's implemented in um, the Maxent GUI software. It's something you have to implement yourself, so it's a little bit of extra work, but um, I think it's, it's pretty important. The idea is we do this with cross-validation. So we split up uh, our data into, let's say, 10 subsets. And if you're not familiar with cross-validation, the, the five-second uh, version of it is that you split up your data into K folds. Let's say K is 10. Uh, so if you've got 100 points, let's say each of your folds has 10 points in it, you fit a model with nine of those folds combined, and then you predict on the 10 points. So you're predicting onto withheld data. And so you can calculate the mean squared error or other metrics of performance uh, and take the average over your 10 folds and that gives you both a mean, which are the red dots here, and uh, a standard deviation uh, that is shown by the little error bars. And so, oops. Uh, someone's showing up in my house, I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, this mean across your 10 folds uh, is represented by the uh, red dots. And so if you're looking at the mean squared error, you wanna have the minimum amount of error, 
So the minimum uh, error under cross-validation is represented by this red dot that's got a dashed line through it. So you could choose that as your, your value of lambda that uh, minimizes your, uh, your prediction error. Uh, but there's a potential that you could uh, overfit in that case. And so uh, there's a, just a conventional rule of thumb that's recommended in the um, Hasty et al. 2009 Elements of Machine Learning book, probably other places too, but that's where I read about it. Um, and the rule of thumb is that they suggest take one standard deviation above that minimum value and use that guy. And so that's what this one is right here. Uh, and so that is the simpler model, one standard deviation um, below the minimum error. And so you have a little bit more error, which are less likely to um, uh, overfit. And so this is a model that after starting out with 10 coefficients, uh, this is a model that retains three of those coefficients. So, uh, whoops. Okay, so the, uh, the important thing about this lasso is that it can be applied in any regression, um, and we just happen to be using it with MaxN. So there's nothing innately MaxN about this. It's just a particular approach to, to um, shrinking coefficients. Um, the really amazing thing that this particular form of regularization does, um, and the, by form I mean the fact that this is the absolute value of the betas. So for example, if you were to use beta squared or some other, um, some other function of beta, you would get different types of regularization. Uh, the really nice thing about choosing that absolute value is that it has the property that it shrinks coefficients to zero. And so it basically does model selection for us. And so if it's gonna do model selection for us, uh, why not explore uh, our parameter space by putting in a whole bunch of parameters and see what comes out. And we can get these very flexible models and uh, I think it's, it's a great way to do an exploratory analysis. May not be the best way to predict, might involve some overfitting, uh, but I think it's a great way to explore if nothing else. And so uh, the paradigm within MaxEnt is to create a large class of different predictors that we put into the model. The machine learning jargon for that is features, and it's a general term that means the different transformations of the predictors. So if you've got temperature, and you just wanna put temperature into the model, that'd be a linear term. If you wanted to put temperature squared into the model, that would be a quadratic term. Uh, you could have interaction terms between temperature and precipitation. You could have threshold terms, which are these uh, abrupt jumps, step functions. Uh, and those, uh, the way that MaxEnt does it by default in the jar version is that it puts a, one of these thresholds between each pair of data points. Um, I believe in the max net version, it chooses 50 of these. I, don't, I can't remember if they're equally spaced or based on quantiles, but it chooses fewer of them basically just because it's not quite as fast at fitting the stuff. Um, and then there are hinge features, which are like step functions, except they can be linear in between the upper and lower limit. And so MaxEnt does um, all pairwise combinations of these guys, MaxEnt jar does that. And so, um, and it gets impractical to fit too many of these with, with max net, you end up waiting for a long time. Um, so I, I don't do it. I'm, I'm sure it's doable, but it's not something I do very often. So the idea is, is if you've got a whole bunch of predictors, you do all these different transformations of them, uh, put them into the model as proposed features to include in the model, and then lasso regularization selects those that do the best job of uh, prediction. Okay. So um, I think it's, uh, it was probably formerly common uh, to just throw in a bunch of correlated predictors, use lots of hinge and threshold and all the default features of MaxEnt, and then just use whatever default regularization parameter um, was provided by the MaxEnt jar software, which is something that um, Stephen did, I think, in the 2008 Dudek and Phillips paper, maybe it was the 2006 paper, I can't remember, um, where they looked at a whole bunch of different data sets and said, what should the best, uh, or not what should, what empirically appears to be the best value of default regularization as a starting point. Um, that starting point, unfortunately, for a long time was taken as um, a rule, or I don't know, maybe it wasn't taken as anything, maybe just people didn't think about it that much. Um, but it's really just, it's just a good starting point. That's it, you still have to do this comparison across different folds to, to figure out. Um, one way of doing that is with um, ENM eval software, which fits it for different values of regularization multipliers or to do the stuff that I've um, just shown earlier. Um, so my preferences, however, um, are to remove correlated predictors a priori. Uh, 
Now, this is um, not required by these lasso um, regressions. Uh, if you've got correlated predictors, what it will do is it will, um, you know, it, if you're thinking along one of those curves, it will, um, with the number of the coefficient value as a function of um, the regularization multiplier, it'll shrink those towards zero. So if there's three things that are correlated with one another, two of them will shrink to zero and one of them will keep going. That's cool. But when you do a bunch of features, those features, uh, you might have, if you've got hinge threshold and so forth features, you may have dozens of features related to a single predictor. If that predictor is correlated with three other predictors, well, then there are dozens of dozens of predictors that are related to one another. And the, at the end, when you look at a marginal response curve, um, it's not something that you can interpret because you don't know whether the, um, the quadratic term for predictor one, for predictor two, or predictor three that were all correlated with one another was retained. You can't follow that. So in the case that you are using all these different predictors and you want to look at a response curve to say, you know, is it modal? Is there an optimal value of temperature that the species appears to prefer? Um, correlated predictors make that interpretation possible. Doesn't make the fitting any worse. Doesn't necessarily make the prediction any worse. It may. Um, but it makes the interpretation harder. And so for that reason, I like to remove correlated predictors uh, a priori. Um, then uh, I prefer to use only features that reflect your interests. So I don't just use the default features. Um, if I want a very flexible model, I'll use hinges and probably only hinges because they're flexible enough that they can capture just about everything. Um, or if I don't need a complex model, I'll just use linear and quadratic features if I just want to see if something's modal, um, but I tune it to the problem that I'm interested in. And then the other key thing that I always do is I try to find that optimal penalty parameter. Um, and I do that with cv.glmnet um, in the second part, of, which is a function in the glmnet package in R. So in the second part of this uh, talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about implementation in R. I'm gonna show you how, how I do this because it's not, um, I'm not, I don't know if anybody else does this. Um, and so, um, if you don't go that route though, uh, ENM eval is a really good option or just manually exploring different regularization multipliers and refitting multiple models and, and seeing which one does best under cross-validation. Um, it's a pretty crit critical thing to do. Um, the last little bit here is, I uh, just wanna mention the way that this is specifically implemented in the Maxent software is uh, we've been looking at this likelihood, the machine learning jargon for this is a gain function and it's a gain function instead of a likelihood function because it's got this penalty term in it. And um, the specific part of this, it's a little bit different from the regular old lasso, is that it doesn't just have a, a regularization penalty by the co multiplied by the coefficient. Um, sorry, this is the regularization penalty here. This is the coefficient. Um, betas and lambdas are used liberally throughout this presentation and in different ways, different contexts. Um, but additionally, there is a multiplication here by the standard deviation of, or sorry, the variance of the uh, predictor. So if there is large variance in a predictor, uh, meaning that the species is not particularly fussy about that predictor because it can occur at any value of it, uh, there should be a larger penalty. Whereas if you can only occur at specific values of temperature, having a large coefficient associated with that is an okay thing because it means that um, you're identifying the temperature values that you're most likely to occur at. And so, um, so basically, this does an additional scaling that says how, whether it's okay, it's okay to have a large value of a coefficient, um, coefficients over here, uh, if the variance is small. And so, um, so that's the specific max implementation. Okay, I'm going to stop there um, because I've been talking forever and I just need a break. Uh, and I'm going to move this section into part two of this week's lecture, uh, talk about offsets and um, implementation in R in the next session. So thanks for listening if you managed to last the entire time and uh, I'll be back in a minute.